Hello, wonderful people. I hope you are all doing well. So I thought today would be a great uh, time to talk about for those of you who are looking to get funded, because especially in the last few years, the, you know, the rise of the, you know, retail prop firm um, kind of culture has meant that when people come into trading, they instantly begin idolizing uh, having a funded account. And that's completely natural. It's completely fair enough. However, this can actually be a massive trap for a lot of people. Um, and people actually normally end up wasting way 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 more money like they just end up losing money in the long run and they begin reinstilling all of the bad things that are actually going to push you further away from getting funding and even worse is when you get funded because a lot of people get funded now but if you knew the statistics on how many people were still funded and still profitable a year after they've been funded, it would really, really put most of you off. And so I can guarantee if it's something that you're interested in or interested in you know, learning more about or whatever, then this video is going to be absolutely critical for you. So I do recommend sticking around till the end of this one. Um, but uh, before we get into all of that, None of this is financial advice, as always, guys. This is all just what I've learned on my journey and the journey of, you know, teaching and coaching, um, you know, hundreds of students um, over the last, um, you know, X amount of years. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. Um, the only way to get funded. The reason I say the only way is because if you try and kid yourself into, you um, uh, you know, thinking that you can avoid these things and not do these things, then you're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're going to waste loads of money. You're going to make the prop firm owners very, very rich, very, very wealthy. Um, and ultimately we want it to be a mutually beneficial relationship. We want to get something out of it as well. And so enough of the talking, you know, about the general themes here, let's actually get into some specific things. So there are two things that you need in order to get funded and more importantly, stay funded. Okay. And unfortunately, most people will rush this. First thing is stats. So what do I mean by stats? Well, if you don't know the following just off by heart, then you are, you're just in the worst possible position, okay? You need to know the win rate of your strategy. You need to know the average risk reward. And the most important one is you need to know the biggest streak of losses, okay? Now, in order for this data to be valid, okay? And I talk a lot about data. I know data isn't the sexiest term or anything like that. And I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of data either. However, when it comes down to it, we do need to know some numbers. And uh, luckily, it's very easy to do. But the bottom line is, in order for this to be valid, you need to, at a bare, bare minimum, you need to have at least 100 trades kind of tested to um, to come to this conclusion and you need to make sure that all of those trades have followed your rules exactly so you don't have like inaccurate um, statistics right um, ideally for me I'd like to do 300 plus um, but 100 is the kind of a bare bare minimum okay so 100 minimum trades okay now Let's look at why these are important. In fact, let's just focus on the most important one here, which is the biggest streak of losses. At the end of the day, you know, no matter how you package it, any failure of a funding challenge or a failure of a funded account, once you have one, is going to be down to you violating one of the rules, okay? And on one of the most common rules is always going to be down to losses, okay? Because that's how everybody is protecting their capital, whether it's the prop firm hedging their risk or you are just as a trader, you know, managing and preserving capital. And so by you knowing the biggest streak of losses, you can begin to establish what the best risk management method is. And of course, I can't tell you and I won't tell you what you should risk. However, I can walk you through what my logic looks Looks like so let's pretend right that you have back tested your strategy 400 three you know 300 400 times whatever and you have established that your biggest losing streak is 10 trades in a row 10 losing trades okay so <clears throat> if you had this during the period of the time that you took the challenge or at any period because um it, you know if you've established that it has happened in the past realistically it's going to happen again um then you don't know when you take that challenge or wh whatever month you're in, whether that's going to be the time when you have one of your winning streaks or when you're going to have one of your losing streaks. And so this is why the name of the game is capital preservation. And so if I know that I'm, I sometimes could have 
a 10 losing streak, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow for a margin of error within that. So I'm going to add five in this case, and I'm going to prepare for five losses in a row. Okay. I mean, yeah, so 15 losses in a row total. Okay. Because if I've established that it's 10, then I bring into account that there are other things there like human error that come into it that could maybe make that losing streak even bigger emotions all that other sort of stuff then adding on five even adding on another five making it 20 losses in a row and just imagining the worst case scenario puts us in the best position because it reinforces the name of the game which is capital preservation which solves a major major issue with funding challenges which is constantly needing to redeposit to get another challenge redeposit fail redeposit fail okay and that is not what we want at the end of the day okay and so when i know this then i can begin to mold my risk management around that so let's just say 15 losses in a row if i was risking one percent um and i had 15 losses in a row that's minus 15 percent most funding challenges uh, will have you know between eight and 12 percent drawdown limit OK, so, of course, in that scenario, that wouldn't be a very sensible risk management approach if you are playing for the long run. And this is what everybody should be doing. Everybody should be playing for the long run. Everyone's obsessed with talking about numbers in the short run. And yeah, look, I got funded. I got funded. Yes. But have you stayed funded? OK, simple as that. And so for me, what I would do is I would simply begin playing out the numbers if I reduce my risk. I'd look at, OK, what if I risk 0.5 percent per trade? If I wanted to be a little bit more extreme, even safer, what if I risk 0.25% per trade? Now, most people will obsess, absolutely obsess about, oh, you know, I need to pass. I need to do this. I'm going to take a slightly more risky approach. I just I just want to quickly get my challenge on unfunded account. You know, I've only been trading for like six months and like I just I need to get funded. And they'll just be completely blindsided to all of this. Okay. And as a result, they will make little to no progress. Okay. So this is how I'm going to begin to mold my risk based on what my biggest streak of losses is. Okay. Now, the next thing you're going to need. Okay. And we have kind of already touched on this with the fact that we've mentioned the stats there is the first step is going to be back testing. Okay. So this is using past data to go ahead and play out um, scenarios. Very, very simple. I've spoken about backtesting a lot on the, the channel. Now, what most people will do is they will skip ahead at this point after they've done their backtesting and they'll go straight to live trading uh, slash um, getting a uh, funding challenge. Okay. This is a mistake because backtesting, you don't have all of the information you don't have all of the vari variables tested yes back testing is good for testing a strategy but what you should be doing afterwards would be forward testing now this is not forward testing with risk this is not me saying go ahead and start live trading at this point this is demo only now why is it important not to skip which is what most people will do why not to skip from back testing all the way over to live trading slash trying to get funded okay so let me just draw this. So what most people will do is just skip over here. Well, because when you're back testing, you have the power of the replay button or whatever the software is that you're using. You don't have to exercise any patience. You don't have anything on the line whatsoever. And whilst you don't necessarily have anything on the line with forward testing, you definitely have to be patient to wait for your specific setups. And just within that one thing, within the patience that you need, brings a whole world of new possibilities and new issues that can go ahead and happen. Now, because of this, forward testing is critical. For forward testing, for me, minimum 20, 20 trades should be forward tested, in my opinion, okay? Ideally 30, 40 plus. Now, if you are the type of person right now who is watching this and listening to me going through this process and you're thinking, oh, this seems really, really long. I don't need this. I'm just going to go and just like continue doing what I'm doing. Guarantee, I guarantee you, okay, go honestly, go ahead and continue doing that. I just guarantee you in six months, you will have made no progress. And I really urge you to remember this video when you go back and you have that experience, okay? Because I've done it countless times, okay? I've seen other people do it countless times, especially because it's become such a culture now. Everyone's so obsessed. Oh, I just want to get funded. Like, oh, you know, it's this big dream in people's he heads, right? Okay, and it's completely fair enough because it's shoved down our throats nonstop, okay? But when you introduce this and you're actually a patient with it, okay? It's not really that much work realistically. You're patient with it. 
then after this, you're going to be in a much better position and a much clearer position for when you go ahead and get on the funding challenge, which brings me on to the second side of this equation, okay, which is balance. So this is essentially discipline, your emotional control and all of these types of topics. Um, traditionally, these things are not spoken about much. I speak about them a fair amount on this channel. Um, but the reason that balance is so important and having some emotional homeostasis, some sort of, um, you know, some, some basically some emotional control is that you could have the best strategy in the world, but if you do not know how to execute on it, if you do not have any kind of discipline, guaranteed there will be problems that pop up and at every single problem you can either respond to it correctly or you can react and just blow everything up. And unfortunately, even if people can stay off, you know, from making a huge mistake once or twice on the third or fourth mistake, suddenly it will all blow out of proportion and they'll have a bad day or something's going on in the rest of their life and it will all just spiral out of control. And this is not helpful whatsoever. Okay. But just by doing this process and being patient with it, not rushing, being like, oh, I need to get funded within the next 30 days, or oh, I need to get funded within the next 60 days, instead of just at Instead, sorry, just absorbing yourself in the process, being patient, exercising that discipline. Because I'm telling you right now, if you cannot exercise the discipline to just do some back tests and be patient, even if it's just 10, 20, 30 a day, um, and then move on to forward testing and just be patient for one, two weeks, you know, not making any money, then you are screwed when it comes to actually doing a funding challenge. Because, yeah, even if you pass, okay, it doesn't matter. Talk to me in two months, three months, four months, five months after that, okay? It's difficult, okay? And so it requires some level of balance. So how do we go ahead and actually create balance for ourselves? Well, routines is going to be a key one, okay? So I'm going to break down my morning routine here. Um, this does fluctuate from time to time, but this is my favorite morning routine. So I wake up, um, key thing is no phone. OK, I like to separate my day into two main halves. The first half is my work half and the second I'm actively detaching. I don't look at anything trading related or business related or anything, anything like it's just focused on the end goal. It's purely about just enjoying myself. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a minute. OK, so wake up, no phone. First thing I'll do is I'll do a 15 to 20 minute meditation <clears throat> the way that i like to do meditation is i just like to do it in silence but i understand that's quite difficult at first i used to find that very difficult and so some alternatives is yoga with an emphasis on breathing breathing into those stretches why because it helps you get out of your head and into your body thereby um, reducing the overwhelm of overthinking and all that sort of stuff another thing is breath work um so there's loads of videos on youtube of breath work um it's basically just breathing exercises and you know again just getting you out of your head into your body okay after i've done that i will do 30 minutes of reading this is one that's a little bit variable for me sometimes if i'm super busy or for whatever reason the time zone that i'm in is a little out of whack for me i can cut this but in an ideal world this is the one that i really really appreciate and it's nothing to do with what i'm reading in all honesty i could be reading a story or anything like that it doesn't bother me why because the value for me in reading is unlike looking at your phone where you wake up in the morning and you're scrolling through instagram and before you before you know it, you've scrolled through you know 100 200 posts within 20 minutes um with reading you're staying on one topic for 30 minutes straight. You're being patient, you're going from one word to the next word, to the next word, to the next word, all on one topic. And it's training your brain to be in a state where you are in control, a relaxed, a focused, a clear head. And I'm telling you, if you've ever had the experience where you've really got into reading something, whether it's an article or a book, after you've been reading it for about 15, 20 minutes, maybe even half an hour or more, you can feel your brain, you kind of get into this clear focus. It's almost like an exercise for your brain. Um, and if you haven't had that experience, just do it. Just take 30 minutes out of your day and just read one thing and just be patient with it. If you find it difficult to read, just be patient. You only need to keep reading for like 10, 15 minutes and you'll just naturally get into a flow state. Okay. But the hardest thing as always, as with anything, is just to start. Okay. After that, I will eat. Then I will go to the gym. Uh, the gym for me is just to, you know, get the blood flowing, get me feeling good. So after the gym, um, like a bit of a greedy pig, I will eat again. 
um and uh and yeah and just on a side note to eating i will mainly have a keto meal for the first half of my day so for me that normally looks like eggs or some kind of egg equivalent if i don't want to you know continuously eat animal products all the time i may change that up um i will have mct oil green tea or some other kind of herbal tea no caffeine for me um just doesn't really agree with me that much um, or some sort of equivalent. So I sometimes have avocado as well, um, stuff like that. Okay. Now the reason for this is when your body has to digest multiple food groups at once, not for everybody, everyone's obviously different, but for me, it slows me down. It, it takes all the blood away from my brain. Whereas if I just kind of have a focus on fats and oil, uh, fats and protein for the beginning of the day, um, then it just gives me an unbelievable level of clarity. And ultimately, if you can't control what you put in your body, then how do you expect to control the thoughts going on in your mind? Okay, now this may all seem very intense if you haven't, you know, built a morning routine before or stuck to a morning routine. Just keep in mind, when I started this, I literally just started with one thing, I waited until I mastered it, and then I added another thing, waited until I mastered that, and it's a slow, slow process, okay? After that, I'm pretty much ready. I come down, I sit down, and I just get my work done for the day. Okay. That will normally be a blend of uh, looking at the charts, waiting for a trade, setting alerts, um, you know, any calls I have to do, or working with members in the academy or any other kind of business related things, um, both in and out of trading. I will kind of do that within this period. After I am done that, uh, then I will transition into the second half of the day, which is actually more important for me, which is active detachment. Okay. Because most people will say, oh, I've stopped trading. Oh, I stopped trading for the day. I only trade X amount of the day. Then they spend the rest of the day like obsessing about trading. All they're thinking about is trading. Um, and I did the exact same thing. But the thing is, is you're not really giving yourself a break if you're doing that. You're just doing a different form of the same kind of thing. And it's a very quick way to get very burnt out and just feel very, very stressed. I used to get very, very anxious um, because I was just constantly obsessed with trading. It's all I could think about. Um, and active detachment for me, I think the main way to put it and the main focus that I've found is to do things without an outcome in mind. So for example, for me, um, I've recently just started getting into the piano. I'm not, I'm, I'm deliberately not trying to put it in my head of like, oh, you know, in, in a year, I'm going to be this incredible piano player. I'm just doing it because I enjoy the process. I'm just having fun with it. And if it doesn't work, you know, if, it, if I get bored of it, I'll just stop doing it. But it allows me to just be a bit creative and just detach from everything else. Now, alternatives, if that is not your type of thing, um, is you can just find any other hobby that you enjoy or anything that just excites you, a topic that you want to research, make a video about something, whatever it is, super 